Uh, hello, it's a great pleasure uh, to talk to you today. Uh, I announced uh, an extremely broad topic uh, when preparing the slides. I uh, introduced uh, a modest word sum, so of course there is no hope to cover incentives and motivation uh, in one lecture. I'll just give, uh, I'll discuss some, some issues uh, related to this. But I'll start with a citation from uh, a well-known book by Jean-Jacques Lafon and David Martimor uh, on the theory of incentives. Uh, and they say that today for many economists, economics is to a large extent a matter of incentives. Incentives to work hard, to produce good quality products, to study, to invest, to save, etc. And they also say that some 50 years ago the word incentive probably was not central to economics. And now uh, incentives is indeed may maybe Economics is not necessarily all about incentives, but at least uh, I think saying that incentives is a central concept uh, in modern economics uh, is a safe and uh, reliable claim. And incentives, of course, uh, we see them everywhere. We face them, we create them, uh, we uh, have some incentives that uh, change uh, our behavior in the workplace, when we study, when we interact with our children, with our parents. Uh, as I said, no hope to give a comp comp comprehensive treatment, so I'll focus <coughs> on uh, some things. So the conventional uh, contract theory or the economics uh, of incentives, as it's sometimes called, focuses largely on the uh, agency problem, which appears when there is one party that has some interest and there is another party, the agent, which acts in the interest of the first party, the principal. And then the principal tries to create incentives for the agent that would uh, align the agent's interests with the interests of the principal. So this is basically the main building block, the principal agent problem uh, framework is the main building block of, of the contract theory. But of course there, uh, there are other ideas, models and uh, theories uh, in this domain. For instance, there's a framework uh, due to uh, Holmstrom that is called career concerns or uh, the implicit contracts uh, where uh, the principal cannot create formal incentives uh, for the agent, but the agent understands that uh, his performance is observed by the market and therefore he wants to do well to get a good wage in the future. Uh, there are models with uh, subjective evaluation and relational contracts when, again, it's not necessarily the market, it may be uh, the current principle, but this current principle cannot commit to formal contracts and then uh, the principle exposed may reward the agent and if the relationship is repeated, the principle uh, has interest to reward the agent for good performance, the agent wants to perform well and uh, this may uh, create incentives even in the absence of formal contracts. Sometimes even formal contracts may uh, undermine the functioning of uh, uh, relational contracts, so-called. Uh, there are other ideas which are more close to the theory of organizations like leadership in organizations. So sometimes uh, the leader creates or changes the incentives of his followers uh, by changing uh, her own actions. So the leader may work hard, the followers observe this, they make inference about the uh, environment in which their organization operates and realize that to work hard is also in their own uh, interest, for instance. So this is the idea of uh, Hermann's paper, leadership by, by example. Uh, so why, why do incentives work? Of course, uh, the most straightforward effect is that incentives change the payoffs that people are facing. So if someone promises you a bonus for achieving uh, certain results, then uh, working hard to achieve them becomes more uh, in your interest. It, it's an, an obvious effect. But also incentives uh, is choice of the principle, and if this principle is 
uh, informed, formally speaking, if this principal possesses some private information when she creates those incentives, then incentives may provide information to the agent, and this is an indirect informational channel. Also, incentives uh, change uh, the information that is created by the agent's behavior. So, uh, both of these ideas I will uh, discuss, discuss in much more detail uh, during this talk. And also, an important uh, ingredient of my today's talk and an important concept is so-called intrinsic motivation. So, uh, it comes from psychology, from social psychology, uh, and uh, it will just claim that there are a lot of things that we do without obvious extrinsic incentives. So we do things just because we like doing them. And this is what intrinsic motivation is about. Uh, well, why, why it is important to describe it in the context of the theory of incentives? That's because incentives uh, interact uh, non-trivially with the intrinsic motivation. In particular, incentives uh, may have perverse effects if uh, the agents have this intrinsic motivation. They may undermine, or, as people say, crowd out it. So this is something I will uh, discuss today. So what, what is intrinsic motivation? As I said, it's something that people do without obvious uh, external reasons. So this is the definition uh, in a, a recent book by Desi and Ryan. Desi is the psychologist who introduced this concept and did the first uh, experiments on it. So intrinsically motivated behaviors are those that are performed out of interest and for which the primary reward is the spontaneous feeling of effectance and enjoyment that accompany the behaviors. Uh, now, what about extrinsic motivation? The citation from the same book, intrinsic motivation contrasts with extrinsic motivation represented by behaviors that are instrumental for some separable consequence, such as an external reward or social approval, avoidance of punishment or the attainment of a valued outcome. So this is a very broad definition of uh, extrinsic incentive. So the conventional theory would say that probably extrinsic incentive typically change your payoffs and would not go uh, into detail. But this, this definition encompasses uh, some th things like social approval, which are more subtle than just uh, material bonuses that you get for good performance. Uh, on the other hand, Krebs, uh, David Krebs, in, in uh, his 97 paper, said that what is called intrinsic motivation may be, at least in part, the, be the worker's response to fuzzy extrinsic motivators, such as fear of discharge, censure by fellow employees, or even the desire for co-workers' esteem. So he kind of says the same thing, but I would emphasize somewhat skeptical uh, uh, claim that uh, it may be very difficult, actually, to uh, draw a borderline between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Because you can say formally that this is extrinsic and this is intrinsic, right? But when you observe someone's behavior to say that this is done because of uh, some fuzzy uh, external motivators, because you hope that you will get respect for this action or because you like to do it. Okay, so, so some extrinsic incentives are salient and obvious, but the, there's also some uh, middle ground which formally can be attributed to extrinsic motivation, but actually it can be very difficult to distinguish, to be distinguished from uh, intrinsic motives. Uh, so as I said, psychologists have been concerned with extrinsic incentives uh, having perverse effects. Well, crowding out is the terminology that was brought uh, into this subject by economists. M maybe it was Bruno Frey who, who was the first to introduce it in his book, Not Just for the Money. Psychologists spoke more of the hidden costs of rewards, and I'll come back to this uh, concept uh, in a few minutes. So, uh, Frey's book was one of the first formal treatments of this interaction between uh, extrinsic incentives and intrinsic motivation, but uh, this was to a large extent uh, a reduced form model. So it was assumed that incentives can have perverse effect and it was difficult to understand when actually this would be uh, the case. So uh, it is essential to understand uh, what, what are the mechanisms, why, why uh, incentives may have uh, perverse effects. Uh, 
when this can be expected and what can be done about it. Uh, so, uh, coming back to this concept of intrinsic motivation, uh, according to Desi and Ryan, uh, there are two uh, basic psychological needs that underlie it. The, the first is uh, self-determination. So this is the idea that we want to do things that we ourselves decide that we want them to do. It's not someone who uh, instructs us uh, how to behave, but it's rather our free choice. And the second is the feeling of uh, perceived competence. So we, we, we like to feel that we are competent in dealing with the environment. And then why intrinsic motivation uh, can be undermined by extrinsic incentives, that's because first they undermine self-determination, uh, they feel that someone tries to influence our behavior, and second, they uh, may undermine uh, the uh, perceived uh, competence. So there are two aspects, Com psychologists call them controlling and informational. Uh, well, another idea from psychology, why, why, why incentives may have perverse effects, which will be related to uh, the Binabuti-Roll 2003 paper that I will discuss furthermore, is the idea that if someone promises you a high reward for achieving a certain outcome, or equivalently if someone promises to punish you severely if you do not achieve some outcome. If, in other words, if you face high-powered incentives, you may think why, why the principal decides to create those high-powered incentives. Probably uh, the principal doesn't trust my intrinsic motivation. So you make an inference from being offered those high-powered incentives and you think that probably I'm not good at this activity and that's why the principal needs to stimulate me. Uh, this is also uh, an idea that uh, Mark Twain uh, expressed in, in, in Tom Sawyer. When Tom Sawyer had to uh, paint the fence. He was not very happy with this. And then uh, what, what he did, he uh, suggested to his friends to allow them to paint a small bit of the fence for some reward on their part rather than his. So he, not only he got the fence painted, but, but also he received a piece of an apple and what, what not from, from his friends. So this is the idea that if you create uh, a positive prize uh, price for something that uh, other people might expect you to pay for, you kind of uh, change drastically the uh, interpretation of the thing and, 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 the, and, the, and the result. So, uh, Binabu and Tirol, uh, 2003 paper, which is called uh, Intrinsic and Extrinsic Motivation, uh, is a principal agent model. Uh, with an informed principle. So the, the first important assumption is that the principle possesses some information that the agent doesn't have. For instance, the principle may know better the ability of the agent to do the task he is facing, or the principle may have a better understanding of the costs associated with this task, or, or the, some long-term benefits that the agent might receive from successful performance that the agent cannot assess himself. Uh, so this may be a model about uh, a parent and a child, uh, or a professor and a student, or an experienced manager and a young employee. So the uh, scope of potential interpretations, applications are uh, very broad. Another important ingredient is that even though the principal is informed uh, about, say, the agent's ability for concreteness, uh, she is not informed about how the agent himself feels about his ability, how self-confident the agent is. So it's a model with two-sided uh, asymmetric information. And then the, the third and last important assumption is that the principal may create incentives for the agent. So the, the main uh, framework in this paper I'll speak about some extensions, but the main framework is where the principal may promise uh, a bonus for good performance to the agent. Uh, then, given that the principal is informed, this is basically a signaling game, because the agent tries to infer information from the uh, principal's policy about the information that the principal has and the agent doesn't have himself. So, 
what happens uh, in equilibrium? In equilibrium, uh, bonuses uh, weakly decrease uh, in the agent's ability. So this, is, this sounds a little bit paradoxical. More able agents receive lower bonuses. Uh, but uh, Benabo and Tirol have an extension where, besides bonuses, the principal can pay lump sum wages. And then uh, more able agents uh, receive low bonuses, that, but they receive high lump sum wages. So, uh, in a sense, it's not true that stronger agents are worse off in this model, just they face less high-powered incentives. So high-powered incentives is a signal of uh, low ability uh, of the agent. And the agent, of course, this is a mod game theoretic model with rational principles, rational agents, so the agent infers uh, from a promise of a high bonus that it's likely that his ability is low. So when someone promises, when the principal promises a high bonus to the agent, the agent has mixed feelings. On the one hand, he is happy to get the bonus because the bonus is there and uh, he will receive it if he performs well, but on the other hand, he understands that it's likely that his ability is low, so it's bad news. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's a it's two-sided two thing. Uh, uh, so on the one hand, g given that bonuses are offered in equilibrium, of course, principles are not stupid, so if they do offer bonuses, they do it for their own good, and bonuses work. If the agent receives a bonus, on the one hand, he understands that probably he is not very uh, uh, well suited for this uh, kind of task, so he makes a negative inference about his ability, and this can be interpreted as something that undermines his intrinsic motivation to work on the task. But on the other hand, given that the bonus is there, he will work on the task. So in the short run, he will work, but if the bonus is withdrawn in the future, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do this task, even though uh, before uh, being offered this bonus, he might, he might well uh, want to do it. Why? Because I forgot to put it on the slide, but of course a, a, another key ingredient of the model, maybe it wasn't the previous one, uh, no, uh, the agent has some degree of intrinsic motivation. So the, I, the idea is that uh, the agent has some interest in what he is doing and uh, the principal's policy can uh, boost this interest or reduce it, but uh, there are two channels. The one is direct, just uh, it changes the incentives, and the other is the informational channels. It changes the agent's beliefs. Uh, and then what are the extensions? Well, first, it's important to mention that it's not essential that uncertainty is about the agent's ability. It can be, as I said, about the costs or benefits of the agent, so it's, the model is quite uh, broad. And then, so this is robustness, but the uh, Benabu and Tirol discussed several uh, extensions, I would mention two of them. One is uh, uh, delegation uh, under certain conditions when uh, the principal delegates decision rights to the agent. Uh, this is good news for the agent. So the delegation is a signal of trust uh, and uh, this boosts the agent's uh, self-confidence, his uh, intrinsic motivation, therefore, and the agent works harder. And another application is help, and with help, uh, Benabu and Tirol, the, the, the main assumption is that uh, the principal's help is a substitute for the uh, agent's own effort. And if this is the case, then if the principal uh, promises to help the agent, start, starts helping the agent, uh, again, for the, for the agent, it's a mixed thing. On the one hand, of course, it's good when someone helps you. The principal will do part of the work. But on the other hand, uh, this is bad news because this shows that the principal does not trust the agent. If uh, the principal's uh, and the agent's effort are complements, then help works like delegation. Then help will boost the agent's so incentive. So it, it, a crucial... Uh, uh, parameter or a crucial uh, assumption in this kind of models is about com complementarity or substitutability between, say, ability and effort, or between efforts of different, different parties. Uh, I'll 
sketch a simplified version of uh, Binabu and uh, Tyrol's model when I'll talk about uh, an experimental uh, paper I've been part of. I had, uh, um, long ago was my job market paper that I never published. I uh, had an extension, dynamic extension of Binabu and Tyrol paper. Uh, it was not a mechanical extension because it was not clear what will happen uh, in the dynamic context because there are a few new effects. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there is the ratchet effect, both for the principal and for the agent. Does everyone know what is ratchet effect? Or it's better? Uh, okay. So um, the ratchet effect is the following thing. Um, uh, it appears in dynamic adverse select. I, I wanted to say models, but it's not models in situations with dynamic adverse selection. Uh, and maybe the best example is uh, uh, from the Soviet plant economy. So assume you are a director of a plant in, in Soviet Union and uh, you received, uh, say, a one year plan to uh, produce a certain number of widgets. Uh, and then you understand that you can uh, perform better and you can actually uh, overshoot the target, say, by 10%. Is it good? Probably it's good. Maybe, maybe you will receive something like a red flag for your enterprise, maybe <laughs> a small monetary benefit even. Uh, but also there is a downside. And what is the downside? What do you think? Yeah. Next, year, next year it's going to be 10% 10, 10 higher, right? So this is, this is the rich effect. If there is no long-term commitment, uh, then uh, the principal will use the information she extracts at the early stages to the detriment of, of the agent. So why, why does the ratchet effect appear here? Because if the agent uh, works hard in the beginning of the relationship, he signals that he is enthusiastic and he doesn't need bonuses. So he reduces the probability that he gets a bonus in the future. If the principal starts the relationship by promising a high reward, she signals she doesn't, she doesn't trust the agent and the agent uh, will not try in the future. So there are two ratchet effects. Also, there's in the version of the model with uh, uncertainty about the agent's ability, there's naturally a rising learning effect because if the agent achieves success in the beginning, he understands that it's more likely that he is talented and he will update his beliefs upward. And uh, if he doesn't achieve success, he will become more pessimistic. And uh, information has value in this, in this model. So the result is that if learning effect is not uh, very strong, say, in the, in the, in, if, if the agent just observes if uncertainty is about ability and the agent just observes uh, his performance, then uh, similar montanistic results obtain. So uh, stronger agents get smaller bonuses and also bonuses weakly increase over time. So uh, if the agent received, uh, was promised a high bonus in the first period, then for sure the, age, the, the principal will offer a high bonus in the future because the agent already knows that uh, he is weak. If learning is strong, so if uh, by, say, working on the task, the agent can learn the precise value of costs, if uncertainty about costs or value, uh, and the agent can learn it with certainty, then the results can change and the principal, in fact, can incentivize stronger agents in the beginning uh, to promote their learning because it, it's, it's similar to introductory pricing in the industrial organization. You make a low price so that consumers buy your product and just learn that the product is good and then in the future you can rise prices. Similar, similar effect uh, obtains here. And now I, I, I'll spend some time uh, speaking about an experiment that tests this uh, Binabu and uh, Tyrol's theory. So we, it, it's a joint paper with Andrei Bremzen, Lena uh, Kachlova and uh, Jeroen uh, van der Ven. So, when we were writing this paper, there was already a huge literature on the interaction between extrinsic incentives and intrinsic motivation, a huge experimental literature in psychology and big enough literature in economics, but still we saw that there is a gap because uh, none of these numerous papers actually, uh, in our view, was a uh, good enough match for the assumptions of uh, the Binabu and Tyrol paper that was quite influ influential by, by that time. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can have a couple of slides that uh, repeat 
uh, themselves. So let, let, let me tell you uh, about a couple of classical experiments about the interaction of perverse effects of, of extrinsic rewards. So one is the, the first study by Edward Desi. It had students working uh, on a puzzle. And then there were two uh, treatments. There was an experimental group uh, and the control group. In the experimental group, the students started by working uh, on the puzzle. Then in the second part of the experiment, each of them was promised uh, $1 for each correct, correctly solved puzzle. And then in the third part, uh, those incentives were removed. In the control group, there were the same three parts, but there were no bonuses promised uh, in the middle, uh, in the second part. And the effect was that uh, those students that were promised a bonus in the middle, in the second part, and then the bonus was removed, they performed significantly worse in the third part. So uh, the uh, bonuses once offered and then removed had uh, bad long-term consequences. And then, then there were dozens of ex similar experiments and results were quite similar. So a psychologist said that reduced liking of the activity, so people started to uh, see less fun in what, what they were doing and also they uh, reduced, reduced effort. Uh, another experiment uh, with a similar idea is by uh, Leper and Quarters, also early 70s. Uh, this is an experiment with uh, small kids, for year old kids. So the, experiment, uh, the experimentalists came to the uh, kindergarten with magic markers, which are just fancy fountain pens. Uh, and they gave them to, to the kids, and then there were three conditions. And the first condition, they just gave those markers to the kids and said you can play with them as well. You can draw whatever you want. In the second condition, they ask them to draw a picture that they would give to the experiment, and the, reward, the experimenter in, the, in, the, in return would reward them with some gold star. Uh, and in the third condition, uh, kids were not promised anything. Uh, they, they could play, but, but then exposed after they finished playing with those markers, they were given gold stars. So the gold, they received gold stars, but that was not something that was promised. And then two weeks later, the uh, experimentalists came back to the lab. Uh, they gave those markers secretly to the kids, secretly in the sense that experimenters themselves did, did not appear, and markers were introduced uh, together with a bunch of other activities. And then they observed the kids and uh, observed how much time they would play with the markets compared to other toys and, and, and uh, uh, activities, available activities. And it turned out that uh, those kids that were promised gold stars uh, uh, found much less fun in playing with the markets and they, they spent much less time uh, with the market. Uh, unexpected reward had no uh, uh, significant effect compared to no reward condition. So what, what is the interpretation? Well, when kids were asked to draw with those markers and promised a gold star, they thought that drawing something with those markers is just an instrument to get a gold star. So of course when they saw those markers without any gold stars, they just thought that there's no point in uh, spending time with them. Uh, when this uh, reward was uh, unexpected, uh, they did not form this strong association and, and it did not have uh, any uh, long-term negative effect. Well, as I said, the dozens, literally do dozens of, of papers in then were written, and of course the, the, the issue was understanding uh, the mechanism that underlie the interaction of the uh, uh, incentives and, and uh, motivation. Uh, in economics, the, the, there were quite uh, a few experiments also. Uh, for instance, for instance paper by uh, Gnizzi and Rustichini uh, is about uh, the uh, negative effect of small rewards. Uh, but here, here the mechanism is very different. So in, in, in uh, their experiment, uh, students were solving, uh, were answering IQ type uh, questions, uh, the 50 questions, and then there were uh, four conditions. And in one condition, they were not promised any reward for correct answers. They just obtained the show up fee. In another condition, they uh, obtained very, very small uh, 
I don't remember the number, don't want to confuse, a very, very small reward for each correct answer. And then in two other conditions, this reward for correct answers was uh, rather big. Uh, big and, and, and very big. So uh, it turned out that the effect of rewards was not monotonic. Uh, being promised a very small reward was worse than being promised no reward. And then when reward became substantial, it uh, uh, increased uh, performance. Uh, there was another well-known paper by Gniz and Rustikini, also uh, published in the same year, about uh, Israeli kindergartens. Uh, when uh, one problem in the kindergartens is that uh, parents pick up their kids late, and what they did, they introduced a fine for late coming uh, parents. But the fine was quite quite small. So what, what happened once they introduced this fine in, in some kindergartens, parents started to come come even later because they considered this fine just as a price for, for a service. So in, instead of feeling shame uh, for uh, making the uh, teachers stay longer at work and working extra hours, they just thought that they have uh, a paid service, which was relatively cheap, so why, 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 why not use it? Uh, interestingly, once, once those fines were removed, uh, the spoiled parents continued to come late. So <laughs> it's, it's a dynamic story. I'm not sure that the directors of the kindergartens that agreed to participate in this experiment were very happy in the end. But Well, I, I'll speak about a, a really paper later. It's more related to an, an, an another theory. Uh, Falcon Cosfold is a well-known paper where it shows that uh, monitoring also uh, has perverse effects on performance. So the uh, extrinsic uh, motivation need not be in the forms in the form of bonuses and fines. It can be other interference like monitoring. So monitoring is like lack of delegation, lack of trust, and that also uh, undermines performance. Uh, so I spoke already about this uh, Benabu in 2003 paper, and, and I'll speak about 2006 paper, which can discuss very different mechanism, uh, and I'll speak about uh, another experimental paper that is related to, to that one. Uh, okay. So what, what, what was the idea of our experiment? Well, to, to test the theory that where uh, positive immediate effect of promised uh, incentives coexist with uh, negative informational effect. And this was quite challenging, and we thought that actually uh, um, this was not something that um, could be observed in, in the existing experiments because in the, in the economic experiments, uh, there was no setup where the principle could be interpreted as being informed. Uh, and in psychological experiments, uh, typically the party that was considered as informed uh, when, when they discussed informational effects of uh, rewards was the experimenter. But in, this, in psychological experiments, the incentives of experimenter are very unclear because experimenters are allowed to lie in psychological experiments. You, you, you don't know what actually the, when, when the experimenter is telling the truth or not, uh, what, what he wants to achieve, what she wants to achieve. So uh, our idea was to have an experiment where both principals and agents would be participants of the experiment with clear incentives and we would manipulate the uh, amount of information that, that, that they possess and, and observe the effects of, uh, of uh, this uh, information. And previewing the results, our results support the, the main implication of the Binabo interval model. So rewards contain bad news, uh, this is correctly perceived by the agents, and these hidden costs coexist with uh, immediate uh, positive effects. So let, let me briefly describe the model. So the model that we had in the experiment was uh, a simplified version of uh, uh, Binabu and Turol, uh general model, so you'll get a flavor of the, of the general model as well. Uh, so there are two players, a principal, she and the, an agent. He, uh, the agent works uh, on a task and his choice is very simple, just zero, one. To work hard, 
choose E equal to one effort, high effort, which costs C, or to choose low effort, which means no cost. Uh, and uh, it is known that the task may be easy or difficult, which means that the cost of effort is either low or high, and this happens with uh, equal probabilities. So the, the information structure. The principal uh, knows uh, with certainty the difficulty of the project. He knows whether C is equal to CL or CH. As for the agent, the agent doesn't know the task difficulty. She knows that it is equally likely to be hard or easy, but also the agent gets a private informative signal SH or SL, which is correct with probability R greater than one half. And this signal is the agent's private information. So as, as in the main Benaboy and Trolls paper, this is two-sided private information. The principal knows the true difficulty of the project, and the agent has some idea about the difficulty of the project that is more precise than the prior, but is not known by the principal. So the timing is uh, straightforward. First, the parties observe uh, their private information, the principal no, learns the difficulty of the project, the agent gets his uh, signal S, then the principal can uh, offer a contract to the agent. The contract is uh, a bonus for uh, high performance or for working hard. We equalize it in, in, in this model and experiment. Uh, there is no stochastic link between effort and outcome in this simplified version. High, high effort means high outcome. Uh, and also a fixed wage. Uh, and the agent receives a prime signal, observes the, uh, the principal's policy, and then decides uh, whether to work hard or not. So the payoffs, uh, uh, this is the principal's payoff, there's some fixed component, uh, lump sum payment. And then uh, if the agent works hard, the principal gets some additional positive payment delta P, uh, net of the bonus that the principal promises for uh, high effort and net of the uh, fixed wage. The agent also has a fixed component pl plus uh, the agent's own intrinsic uh, benefit from hard work. So this is, again, some degree of intrinsic motivation. The agent gets some own benefit from high work. Net of cost and plus the bonus promised by the principal and plus uh, the fixed wage. Well. As I already saw, Benabu Tro show that in any perfect Bayesian equilibrium, this model uh, rewards are positive immediate reinforcers. A higher bonus increases the probability of high effort, but also uh, rewards are informative and they convey bad news. Uh, the principal gives weekly higher bonuses when the task is difficult. And the intuition is that uh, when this task is easy, the agent on average will be more self-confident. Uh, it's more likely that the agent receives uh, a signal CL when, uh, SL when, when, when the cost is low CL. So in a sense, it's cheaper for the principal not to provide incentives because the agent is more likely to work anyway. So this, uh, this is, Benabu and Trou calls this the trust effect. So a high bonus signals the objectively uh, motivated lack of trust on the, on the principal's side. Uh, we make some assumptions that the agent's own benefit is between CL and CH. So what, what does this mean? Were the agent to know that uh, the, the project is difficult, it would be optimal not to work on this project uh, without additional bonus. Uh, if the agent knew that the project is easy, it would be optimal for him to work on the project even without any uh, additional incentives. Uh, the principal can, in, 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 in our simple model can offer just two bonuses, zero and uh, B star, and B star is such a bonus that if we add B star to the agent's own payoff from hard work, it exceeds the age. So if the agent gets bonus B, B, B bar, so not, not B star, B bar, if the agent gets B bar, then for sure his uh, payoff from working hard is larger than payoff from, from shirking. So this is a level of bonus that is sufficient to uh, make the agent work whatever, whatever his beliefs about task difficulty. Then we introduced some some parameters. I'll, I'll, I'll not uh, spend time on this. As, as is typical in signaling games, there are lots of equilibria, so we need some additional instruments to make stronger predictions. We uh, use uh, D1 criterion of um, chalk reps. 
uh, to make a single prediction. And this is uh, in the unique equilibrium that satisfies the D1. Uh, the principal never pays a fixed wage. Uh, and uh, offers no bonus when the costs are low and randomizes between uh, bonus uh, B bar and no bonus when the costs are high. Uh, as for the agent, the agent exerts effort if he is either offered a high bonus or if he receives a good signal. If he gets no promise of a bonus and, and his signal is bad, then he randomizes between effort and uh, no effort. So now, now the challenge for this experiment. The challenge is to uh, come up with a design that would allow to both facts to reveal themselves somehow, to, to be able to observe potentially bo both the uh, positive direct effect and also the informational effect. Uh, of course, in some experiments, people ask participants about their beliefs, and then there are debates how is it better to do this, is it better to incentivize belief elicitation so that people get uh, some additional reward for uh, communicating uh, their beliefs precisely or just to ask them. But here we didn't want to use this because this would make this informational effect of rewards too salient. So in a sense, we would create, create very strong what is called experimental demand effects. Like, right? We would kind of tell participants we're interested in what you think about uh, what information may be contained in the bonus. So we, we, we wanted to avoid this uh, as much as possible. So we, what, what, what we did was some compromise. So what we, we said there is uh, an alternative project on which you work without this principle. And it is known that your payoffs from this second project are identical to the payoffs from this project. So you make two choices, how much you, uh, effort you exert when interacting with the principal, but also you decide how much to work uh, on your own project that is known to be of the same difficulty of this one. So it, in a sense, we're asking about beliefs, but trying to disguise it at least to some extent. Uh, okay, I, I, I already uh, told this. Also, we wanted to see how the principal's access to information about the project difficulty changed the thing. So we had also treatments where the principal was not informed. So we wanted to see just how people react to bonuses when objectively they cannot contain any private information. So in equilibrium, uh, with uninformed principal, the principal always, always offers a bonus and the agent always exerts effort uh, in the joint project. And in the own project, the agent exerts effort if he gets uh, a good signal and he doesn't exert effort when he gets bad signal. So the hypothesis are that the informed principal is more likely to offer a high bonus when she observes a high level of cost. So this is the first uh, result of Benabu and Terol's model and uh, our version of it. A uh, high bonus increases effort by the agent in the joint project because otherwise the bonus would not be offered. The bonus is sufficient to convince the agent to work hard. With an informed principle, so in the treatments where principles are informed, uh, the agent infers bad news from uh, being offered a high bonus and consequently reduces effort in his own project. So this is the element of the design that allows us to see whether the informational effect exists or not. And then with uninformed principle, uh, the agent infers no information from the bonus uh, and his uh, effort on the own project is unaffected by the size of the bonus. Uh, some elements of the design, so participants were randomly matched in pairs, they were rematched every round not to create any long-term uh, incentives. Uh, it was what is called the stated effort experiment, so they, would they, would just, they just received the description of the costs and benefits associated with their choices and exerting effort mean, meant choosing one rather than zero, right? So it, it was just a game they were playing without uh, doing real stuff. You know, sometimes many experiments nowadays are with real effort and real effort may be just copying some meaningless text, text or count, counting zeros in big matrices or some sorts. <laughs> so this, this, this was not, uh, uh, this was not uh, real, this was, this was stated. Also, we, we went for 
I, I go a little bit in the details, of, but if you, if, if, if you run experiments or if you are contemplating running experiments in the future, th those are the choices that you have to make. Uh, uh, for instance, whether, whether you want to work with stated effort or uh, real effort, because e every approach has its own pros, uh, own pros and cons. We also went for the uh, labor market framing. So the, I, I, the purest approach to experiments was that it should be labeled like participant one, participant two, action A, action B. So we uh, said that this is the principle, this is the agent, this is wage, this is bonus. Uh, there was a paper, I think by David Cooper, and uh, um, I, don't remember, I don't remember the citation. There was a paper that showed that in, in this sort of signaling games, if you introduce uh, uh, real names for, for meaningful, meaningful labels for the action that agents take, it accelerates learning. And given that the experiment was quite, quite complex, we decided that uh, there's relatively little chance to observe anything meaningless, so we, we decided to, uh, g to agree this chance somewhat. Uh, also, for the same reason, that's another choice that you have to make. If you rematch people, one thing you can do is you can allow them to play in different roles. Or you can just keep them playing the same role during the whole experiment. Uh, we wanted to uh, allow them to be in both roles, again, with the idea to give them more chance to think strategically on the part of the other side. Because if, if you are always the principal, you may not just think about this problem uh, as the agents think. So we wanted, we wanted to create incentives to look at it from uh, both ways. So this was within subject design in the sense that uh, the difference between informed and uninformed treatment was that some participants started by playing in the informed condition when the principals were informed and then had 12 rounds of uninformed condition. And for others, the order was different, but it was not different participants who played in uh, different conditions. Also, participants have, uh, observed the cost of the project and all payoffs at the end of every round, so they get, they get feedback. Uh, and they are paid for every round. That's another choice that you have to make. For, in, in one recent experiment, we decided to pay, for instance, for two out of 20 rounds. Because if you pay for every round, uh, the, the downside is that uh, you can't pay a lot unless you are very rich, and we were not rich when we were running this experiment. So if, if you pay for just one round out of 20, um, you, you, you create some uh, potential misperception by, 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 by people. You, they understand that it's very likely that what they do in this particular round has no consequences for them. So th that's kind of a trade-off that probably should be resolved depending, depending on each on, on, on depending case by case. So we had 150 uh, participants. We started this uh, uh, with master students at new economic schools who are uh, who, who already get, got some training in game theory, so they were quite sophisticated. But, but also we wanted to uh, have a pool of subjects that would be more naive. So we also ran several sessions with uh, first year undergraduates in the Academy of National Economy who. Uh, got virtually no training in microeconomics and game theory at that point. And um, this, the results were very similar, so that kind of gave us much, much more confidence. Uh, so the results, uh, uh, indeed, uh, principals uh, promised higher bonuses when they observed high costs. So the, the, first, the first result uh, is uh, qu quite strong. The difference is uh, very substantial. The same in, in the regression table. Uh, as for behavior of agents, uh, when the principal is informed, so in the treatments where the principal does have private information, uh, a bonus increases uh, effort uh, in the joint project. Uh, so the bonus does work as a short-term uh, uh, reinforcer, but as for the own project, uh, when the principal uh, promises high bonus, the agent significantly 
and strongly reduce their effort. Uh, this also, this effect should not be there, it, it, but it, it was, I think it was significant at 10% level, maybe marginally significant, <laughs> but m m m much, much weaker than those. So agents do perceive the uh, negative information that is contained in the offer of high-powered uh, incentive scheme. Uh, in the control treatment, uh, the bonus increased uh, effort on the joint project and had no impact uh, in the own project as predicted. Uh, and also, the, also there was some uh, uh, learning going on. So the agent's reaction to the bonuses uh, was developing gradually over time. So those are 20 periods. In the beginning, uh, there was no reaction, but in the end, it was quite strong. So Apparently, uh, agents needed some time to understand this relatively complex uh, informational game that's, go that's going on. For, as for the principles, their uh, decision to promise a high bonus when the project is difficult uh, came very fast. So it, the, the principles did not need time to learn to behave uh, in this way. We also, we also had uh, measured social preferences of the agent, but I will, I will not stop on this, there, there were no really uh, interesting results. Okay, let me, let me say that I, I, I was speaking about theories and, and uh, experiment that, experiments that show that incentive scheme may have perverse effects, but I, I'd like to uh, put it clear that uh, incentive schemes very often produce very good results. So it's not, it, 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 it's not that we, we, sh we shouldn't finish with understanding that uh, we should always uh, pay flat wages to employees and not, not try to affect them. So wh wh one well-known paper is by Ed Laziaro that reports a natural experiment when peace rates were introduced uh, in a big company uh, in, in America that changes uh, glasses uh, on, on cars. Uh, so there, were, there was a big labor force, and uh, uh, at some point the company decided to change uh, the payment scheme. Instead of paying hourly, hourly wages to, uh, to, the mechanics, to the mechanics that were, uh, changing, uh, uh, that were changing glasses, they uh, started paying peace rates. And the positive effect on the workers' uh, productivity was there, and it was very strong, almost 50 percent. And there, there are two mechanisms that underlie this positive effect. So the first mechanism is that some part of workers who were already in the company started to work harder, because now they obtained an opportunity to uh, make more money by, by, by working harder, and they, they, they uh, received an obvious incentive for this. But some workers were unhappy with the peace rates that were introduced, and they left the company. And the new workers that came on, over, on average were stronger than the ones, or at least more motivated. I, I, I should, probably shouldn't say stronger, but they were more motivated to work hard, and the positive effect was roughly a half of it was due to the change in the composition of the labor force, and half of it was due to the uh, stronger incentives of those already present. And the gains were divided uh, between the company and the workers who started to make uh, more money. Now, I have little time, uh, but I, I want to, to speak at least briefly for, about uh, in, in another uh, paper by Benabou and Tirol and about another experiment that is related to it. So, uh, this paper um, asked the following question. Uh, many things we uh, we, we all are to a larger or small extent engaged in kind, some kind of prosocial activity. So we do things that have benefits for other people with a cost to ourselves and without obvious direct benefits for ourselves. And then the question is why do we do this? Uh, in behavioral economics there are a bunch of theories that say that people are altruistic, they are inequity averse, they have prosocial preferences. Uh, that's probably part of the story. But an, another important ingredient that was emphasized, say, in Bernheim and 
in Adjourney and Bernheim and in, 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 in other papers, is image motivation. So we do many things because we want to be perceived as good people. And this is the uh, main building block of this uh, Benabo and Tirol 2006 paper. So in, the, in their model, uh, people have extrinsic motivation. There, there are some policies that can be applied by the principal or by the society for doing certain things. So think of blood donation. Uh, either the society may decide to pay for blood donations or not to pay for blood donations. So there's kind of extrinsic policy. Also, there are some intrinsic benefits. So some people, uh, well, I, I was going to say enjoy. Uh, probably you can't enjoy donating blood, but you say they <laughs> they think that it's valuable and they 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 just get some internal benefit from 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 doing this. And ultimately, there, there's this third ingredient, which is image motivation or reputational concern. So people want to be perceived as good people. Technically, this means in this model that they want the society to infer that their intrinsic motivation is high. This intrinsic motivation, their true willingness to do uh, this prosocial activity is not directly observed by the society. It can be inferred from what, how they behave, from what they do. And then probably if someone donates blood, on average people would think that this person is more likely to be uh, concerned with other people than the one who doesn't donate. Uh, other, other things equal. Uh, okay, I, I, I already said this. Uh, I was going. I was going to speak a little bit about um, a, a recent paper uh, with. Uh, I don't have. Do I have? Yeah, with Ivan Zarapera, Jeroen van der Ven, and Marie Claire uh, Vilval uh, about. Uh, bad reputation that it builds on Binabu and Tirol's theory. So I, I'll, I'll very, in the, how much time I have? Like two, two minutes, three minutes? Okay, I, I, I'll go really, really fast. Uh, maybe I won't go much beyond the example and just sh show, showing the model. So uh, the idea of the paper is the following. Uh, there, there's this Binabu and Tirol paper which said that there's this image motivation and, and one of the central questions in Binabu and Tirol is how extrinsic uh, motivation may affect people signaling uh, motives when they behave prosocially. So the idea is the following. If, if you are paid for donating blood, then donating blood is not such a strong signal about your prosocial attitudes, right? Because other people may think maybe this guy donates blood because he uh, thinks about other people, but maybe he just needs money, right? So uh, th this is kind of the, the, the essence. So it's about the interplay between extrinsic incentives and uh, image motivation. And there, there was other empirical work that showed that typically, uh, uh, typically image motivation is something that creates incentives for behaving well, for behaving pro-socially. In this paper, we wanted to uh, look at a situation where image motivation is something that gains, uh, that goes against uh, your pro-social uh, your desire to behave uh, genuinely prosocial. So this is the uh, motivating example. So assume that you want to, uh, you, you go uh, to a friend and you can buy a bottle of wine. And you can buy uh, a sophisticated bottle of wine or you can buy a bottle of wine uh, which looks cheap but which, which is in fact good. Th this is an example that was chosen by, by, by one of my authors. It's not a very good example because I looked at the rankings of this wine. So it's not a hidden gem. It's, <laughs> it's a bad wine, but <laughs> as far as I understand, <laughs> relatively bad wine. But uh, the, the idea is that there, there are bottles of wine that may look cheap, may, that may be cheap, but e effectively, if you know, they're much better than wine that is twice or thrice as expensive, right? So which kind of bottle will you take? So it, it, it depends, of course, of course uh, on your relationship w with, with people where you go. If, if you know them well, then maybe you will go for something that doesn't look very sophisticated, but you know that it's great wine, right? If you don't know much about those people and it's essential to be on the safe side, you just bought by a bottle that looks expensive enough. And, uh, so uh, th that's a trade-off. Um, uh, also, the, the, our experiment is related to the trade-off that uh, car mechanic or a dentist is facing. So assume uh, uh, your dentist knows that your mouth, your teeth uh, need a major repair. <laughs> and then uh, she may say, uh, you're fine this time, just let's make something trivial and then 
let's look next time. Because she, she doesn't want to give you bad news. It's similar for a car mechanic. A car mechanic may tell you you need to replace your engine, or he can tell you just change the oil and, and you are fine, right? And on average, after the mechanic tells you just change the oil, you are fine, you have much better confidence in this mechanic that he is honest and he's not going to make a lot of money on you. So uh, th th this is the idea. So put yourself in the shoes of the mechanics. He, who, kno who knows that you need to do a major repair, but he understands that if he tells this, if he tells this, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if he tells this, you will uh, infer that maybe he is not very trustworthy. Uh, and then we had uh, an experiment that, uh, okay, I'll, I'll skip the model, an experiment where uh, indeed uh, there were mechanics, I, 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 will, I will stop in, in, in 30 seconds, just. <laughs> uh, there were mechanics, there were the recipients, and, and the, uh, I, 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 I will stop in, in, in 30 seconds. Uh, unless I'm distracted. So, <laughs> uh, it turned out that uh, image motivation per se, just genuine image, we, we created in, 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 without any material consequence, was, was not enough to create perverse incentives where uh, players who played mechanics would suggest uh, a minor repair just to look good. So, image motivation per se was not sufficient. But when uh, recipients uh, could uh, reward mechanics uh, for their actions when they played a dictator game after that. Uh, then it turned out that perverse behavior appeared when mechanics would suggest a minor repair even if they knew that the major repair is needed. Uh, okay, uh, I apologize for uh, taking uh, longer uh, and let me stop here. Okay. Dear Anton, many thanks for your lecture. I will have questions. So I have a real uh, concern with this literature because it uses um, too much emphasis on middle class culture and middle class Western culture. And it ignores the existing psychological and sociological literature on differences by culture, by race, by ethnicity, and by IQ. So for example, you said, Comparing NES graduate students with first year students is a big difference, but it's not in my mind. I would like to see you do it with hooligans and students kicked out of Russian schools and see how big that difference is. And the reason I mention this is that to look at something even like perception of a simple task, delegation. There is literature in America that shows that the permanently unemployed, those who have problems getting any basic job, when given normal tasks at McDonald's or other fast food places, view it as disrespect and are insulted and leave or will get fired or make trouble. Similarly, Genesi and Rustichini, I wonder if it can be replicated in Japan, which is a very honor-based country. And similarly, for many of these kinds of tasks, if we were to compare, say, middle class or school Russians and Americans versus those in the slums of Paris or Chicago. I wonder if we will get the same effect. So that I'm saying there's severe heterogeneity according to IQ, culture, and personality. So people are very neurotic, people are easily offended, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So given this, my concern is all of these are phrased in highly general ways, but the general, gener I suspect the generality is very suspect. And none of the control groups control for these factors that I've ever seen. I've never seen a single experiment which does this correctly. John, I cannot but agree, of course. And, but I, I would interpret it not as a strong criticism, but rather as a research agenda. That, uh, because uh, I, I think, I think sti still that, that between, between uh, master students, second year master students at NAS and first year at the graduate, there's a huge gap in knowledge. But of course, I, w I, I definitely wouldn't go with this experiment to babushkas from the street, because they would just not understand what is probability. And I, I would, <laughs> there was just no, <laughs> I, 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 even if I were to go with it with, to uh, uh, language students, or I don't know. But that's yeah. your, your it's, so I, 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 I take it, so I, in a sense, we stretched it to, to, to the limit, probably, because, yeah, of, of, co of, course, of course, environment affects how people react to incentives.
Anton, thanks so very much for your uh, nice presentation about uh, incentives. And uh, uh, while you were presenting, you always uh, mentioned about bonuses. And I would, would just uh, uh, ask you if you could uh, somehow um, refer to other kind of incentives and uh, which kind of literature uh, is addressing different incentives, different from bonuses, because uh, maybe also referring to John's question, you can have that for someone, uh, a bonus could be uh, effective if it is framed in a way and not in another. So this is just uh, you know, uh, a clarification about this. I will partially answer. So, so I, I, the, the, the experiments that look at uh, control, Falcos, Fal for instance, uh, th there is literature that is to some extent relevant, even somewhat different, on, on feedback, because feedback also affects how, how what information people get. And it, it's also incentive. I, I want to speak about this, but you know, to, 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 to little time. Uh, in one of experiments of Ernst Ferwood courses, they looked at different framing, and framing mattered a lot. So if the same incentives as frame that bonus or a fine, the, the reaction was very, very different. So it, it's true that uh, people pay a lot of attention to framing, so th those are quite quite subtle things. And some, some are uh, easily made compatible with rational reasoning, and some are probably no. more in the domain of behavioral economics. Like loss aversion. And yeah, and loss aversion so framing. I have two questions. One question is an interpretation question. In this whole literature, you have this effect that if you first give a bonus and then take it away, people react in a very bad way. Some people interpret it in very different ways, but one interpretation is, and that's also true in the labor market experiments, is negative reciprocity. So that basically, it's not about the bonus, it's about the, uh, the withdrawal of the bonus. And I feel treated badly, and my research response is shirk not work, I'm gonna hit back, back, back at you basically. So that, that's one question. Another question is on your examples of a dentist and, and a car repair in, in the experiment. So basically, is it a smart thing or is it a good strategy to try to build a reputation by saying something that basically you, you know could turn out in reverse? Because if you say, you just need mind repair, but next week the car breaks down on a big trip on the holiday, or or say you, you, your teeth are fine, but I'm going to Vietnam and have major problems there. Uh, this kind of informational cascade. So you're trying to build a reputation by make, making an informational cascade, but it's breakable, and and then it, and then you will have negative reciprocity. So maybe that explains the result in a way, because the way you have framed it in the experiments, uh, the building of reputation is a very risky way of building reputation. And, where, and, and I wonder what would happen if you allow these agents to make this choice to build a reputation in a safer way, less breakable way. Wouldn't they be more likely to do it? Yeah. I'll answer to the second question first, yeah. maybe. <laughs> uh, last in, first out. So uh, I think that maybe the correct interpretation would, interpretation would be marginal, right? So of, of course, I, if you know that the car can break uh, 10 minutes after it's out of your garage, probably you won't say that you can drive safely, right? So, but on the margin, probably those concerns can still play a role. So that, that, that's, that's one thing. Um, regarding negative reciprocity, I, I definitely agree. Just uh, it, it's another, another force which would uh, work uh, in the same direction. But then the question is, do we want to take negative reciprocity just given or try to explain it to some of us? Do we want to microfound it more, just take as a basic, basic ingredient of our preferences, which is also fine, I think, so. Okay, no, no, yeah, def no, definitely very, and loss aversion. So, so there are ma ma many, many concerns that are out of the model, but, but just, just, yeah, yeah. It seems that uh, incentives which are caused by prosocial behavior really de depend, highly depend on the increasing power of social networks because uh, they are one of the instruments for uh, making the image of a, of a person. So um, have you measured it somehow? Maybe uh, have you read any uh, papers which also measure this? Because uh, probably the, uh, the power of those incentives really incre increases with the increasing uh, role of social networks in general. 
De definitely very, very le legitimate uh, remark. I, 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 it, it's probably uh, my road of illiteracy. I cannot just offhand m mention uh, any experimental, any, any experimental work that would explicitly take into account the network structure, but definitely n network economics is developing very fast, so I would not be surprised that one or two years ago there the, the are papers on this, I just don't know them. But uh, for instance, in, in, in this experiment, uh, in, in the last experiment, we asked participants whether they're friends with the people they're interacting with. So in a sense, we had like a binary, very simple network where you either a friend of someone or not, and uh, it didn't have very strong effects here. But, but in other contexts, of course, it, it can be very important, and I think it's very uh, interesting and uh, promising direction for, for, for research, definitely. Okay, since we are a bit out of time, uh, thanks again, Anton, for your... Thank you, thank you very much.